In Pavlov's research, he started finding certain phenomena related to classical conditioning. Uh, we talked about acquisition. There's higher order conditioning, right? There's also stimulus generalization and stimulus discrimination, sometimes just called generalization as in Myers or just discrimination as in Myers. But other books call them stimulus generalization and stimulus discrimination. And remember, all of this can also happen in operant conditioning. But right now, we're only talking about them in terms of classical conditioning but keep that in mind that was what module 28 was about that great chart at the end of module 28 you'll need to know that okay so what is generalization well you know the word generalize you also know the word discriminate right but to generalize I can generalize a claim if I think something if I feel like I don't like um, I'm just making something up I don't like uh, K-pop. If I don't like K-pop, I might think that other people don't like K-pop. I am generalizing my view onto a broader group of people, and obviously that's untrue given the mass popularity of K-pop, right? Discrimination, we know we usually see that word in a negative way, but we discriminate on a daily basis. When you choose a hamburger or a hot dog, you are using discrimination. You are making a choice to respond to one stimulus as opposed to another, right? So discrimination is is making some type of difference. Uh, your choice is, you're using some type of difference principle to make a choice on between two stimuli. Okay, so in terms of classical conditioning, we have generalization. And really what happens is, remember the little Albert, um, um, John Watson, the little Albert experiment, so to speak, where he actually, every time he showed this, the little baby a white fluffy rabbit, I know this rabbit isn't white, but I think in the original one it was, uh, right before that he would, you know, right when he showed it to him, he would bang a loud, a loud noise behind the baby's head, and the baby eventually started associating the loud shrieking noise with the rabbit and became afraid of the rabbit, right? Eventually he just showed him the rabbit, and he started freaking out. But then when he introduced other smaller white furry animals, the little Albert also had a fear response. And remember, originally he was not afraid of the white rabbit. So the fear to the white rabbit was a conditioned response. And the white rabbit was a conditioned stimulus. The loud noise was the unconditioned stimulus. But eventually he started becoming afraid of all these small furry animals. That would be stimulus generalization, right? So it's when we basically extend our conditioned response to, to a stimulus or stimuli that are similar but not exactly the same as the original conditioned stimulus. Condition means learned, right? Okay, discrimination is we can actually teach um, animals and humans to actually distinguish between stimuli that are similar. So again, we notice that there's some similarity between this and this, right? Um, so sometimes the organism will do this on their own. So little Albert was not afraid of larger dogs because they were different enough from the rabbit to little Albert. Okay, so he would discriminate um, um, that. That would be an example of discrimination. We can also teach um, animals to discriminate. And the way we can do that is actually by using classical conditioning. So here's another example. So that's a tuning fork that when um, when it vibrates, it actually creates a sound, a tone. Remember we learned about that tone, like different pitches? We can actually condition an, a dog to salivate to a tone, right? Because we would, we would present the tone, the tuning fork, and that's the tuning fork, and then food, right? The food is the unconditioned stimulus. This starts off as a neutral stimulus. But as we continually pair them together, eventually this becomes a conditioned stimulus that when the dog hears that specific tone, it will salivate, right? That becomes a conditioned stimulus, and this now becomes a conditioned response. Well, if generalization was occurring, when an animal heard another tone, even if that tone was higher, 
are lower, the animal might salivate. But a way to actually get the animal not to salivate would be to never um, actually pair this new tone with food. So if we never compare, um, combine the new tone with food, the animal would eventually learn that this newer tone does not signal, remember, unconditioned stimulus is the food, and the dog would stop. As you can see, it says no salivation. So an some animals do this. They simply do it without any prior classical conditioning. It just seemed like in the little Albert case. And sometimes we can use classical conditioning to teach stimulus discrimination. How this functions in real life. Perhaps you have a physics test and you have a English test and perhaps one of them evokes a more anxiety in you. That would be stimulus discrimination, right? It's, so this happens, this has real life applications and it happens on a daily basis.